Good evening, everyone, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, spring meeting. Uh, clearly, uh, due to COVID circumstances, this has become a second virtual meeting. Uh, but I did see some good news in my inbox today. Um, I saw some advertisements for concerts uh, and ticket sales for September in Philadelphia. So uh, I have a lot of hope that our uh, fall meeting, which is going to be uh, an in-person live full day meeting, will uh, go as planned and will not be virtual. Um, we have an excellent program for you this evening. Uh, a personal friend of mine and someone who I have a lot of admiration for, Kate McGinnigal, will be giving our keynote address followed by um, our uh, rapid fire presentations. Uh, and for those DVBS members uh, who are here, please do stick around for the business meeting. It should be pretty brief, but has a couple of pretty important things that we need input on uh, from the membership. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Aziz to get the program started. Thank you. All righty. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Prani. All righty. Uh, good evening, everybody. Before we get started, um, a few high, uh, housekeeping items that I want to remind everybody. Uh, first, at the bottom of your, of your screen, you will see a chat button and, and a Q&A uh, button. For tonight's session, if you have to ask any questions about presentations, kindly use the Q&A button only. Number two, uh, there is a lot of time for questions, but uh, make sure that you write your question during the presentations. Please do not wait until the presentation is over because then it will become difficult to, an to answer those questions. I'm also uh, going to ask all presenters this evening to keep their cameras off and microphones muted until we get to their, uh, get to their turn for presentation. Um, as you know, that I'm responsible for keeping the sessions on time, so I will uh, uh, respectfully request everybody to limit their presentations to the time so that we have three minutes for the presentation uh, and two minutes for question and answer for each presentation. Uh, to start off the evening, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine McGinnigal to you, who is our keynote speaker today. She's an assistant professor uh, in basketball surgery at the University of South Carolina and also the director for the Enhanced Recovery Program. Uh, Dr. McGinnigal, we're, uh, we're honored to have you here. Uh, thank you so much for sparing your time for us. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Trani, for the invitation and Dr. Aziz and the rest of the program committee for having me. Uh, it's a real honor to, to present to you tonight, and uh, Jose will tell you that I'm always excited to be given the opportunity to talk about enhanced recovery after surgery. And uh, after this year, I'm sure all of you feel battered. I know I certainly do. Um, it's a little bit hard to understand why some of these things that we do every day actually really matter. But I promise you by the end of this, uh, I'll tell you why enhanced recovery after surgery matters even in the middle of a pandemic. I don't have any financial disclosures, but um, I will make a personal one, which is to say that Dr. Trani is the reason I'm a vascular surgeon. Uh, I know he knows that, but I've never actually said it to about 50 people uh, in his society. But he was a fellow when I was a junior resident. We had a call weekend with four dissections, two of which were complicated. I'm sure he doesn't remember it, but for me, it was one of the best times of my residency. And he always took an extra minute to make sure I understood what was going on. He showed me the terror recon images. And uh, you never know when that kind of kindness uh, makes a pivotal difference. So if I can be that to you or any of your trainees, um, my door is always open. And if any of you have any follow-up questions that we don't get to address today, I'm more than happy to take your calls or emails. Thank you. Today, um, it's really just three objectives that I have. One is to go over the fundamentals of ERAS, just to make sure we all actually know what it is and are on the same page. I'll update you with the current state of ERAS and vascular surgery, and then also spend the last half of the talk really sharing with you why ERAS matters to me. ERAS really is all about surgical recovery. And if your hospital is anything like mine, there's a ton of competing interests and lots of different moving parts throughout the perioperative space. Back in 1997, Dr. Henrik Kellett, uh, who is an anesthesiologist uh, at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, published a paper suggesting that multimodal surgical care was a way to organize and streamline all of these different disciplines. 
The idea here is all of us, of course, use our individual clinical expertise to make a plan for a patient. We often do that based on individual factors, um, but mostly based on external evidence. And we spend most of our time kind of in this midsection of the Venn diagram uh, explaining the technical aspects of an operation to a patient, um, but not really understanding what their values are and what their expectations are. And when you overlay this kind of preoperative education and expectation setting, you turn out uh, to focus on a lot more patient-centered outcomes. And then that marries with what the nursing staff can do in the postoperative space. And so it's in this kind of confluence that you really get ERAS. And specifically what that means um, is that there's a, a significant number of core elements. And these elements are present for any ERAS pathway, regardless of surgical specialty. Um, they can be standardized a little bit uh, based on what your interests are, but for the most part, I'm going to go through and actually read this all to you because this is really important. To have an ERAS pathway, you really need to have each of these things. In the preoperative space, as I mentioned, surgical education and expectation setting is very important. There's a lot of literature, none in vascular, but in many other specialties about the consumption of a carbohydrate drink two hours before surgery. This helps attenuate the stress response and avoids hyperglycemia. There's a lot of focus, especially in the United States, about multimodal analgesia, which is a way to avoid opioids. That involves anti-inflammatories and gabapentinoids in the pre-op holding area. Um, obviously, VTE prophylaxis, and then less relevant for us um, is avoidance of bowel prep. And this really is mainly to maintain fluid status. And one thing we can do as vascular surgeons um, is to actually follow the ASA guidelines for fasting and only have people um, stop clear fluids two hours prior to surgery and solid foods eight hours prior to surgery instead of the standard MPO after midnight. Interoperatively, there need to be defined pressure goals. Obviously, we follow SKIP guidelines for antibiotics. The anesthetic approach is standardized and also includes multimodal analgesia and avoidance of opiates. And there's a lot of attention paid to the balance of crystalloid, colloid, and presser usage to avoid um, under-resuscitation, but also more importantly, over-resuscitation and fluid overload. Postoperatively, um, the care continues with multimodal analgesia. And then it's really about coaching the patient to get back to as close to normal as quickly as possible. And that's done through frequent mobilization, um, removal of NG tubes, catheters, IV fluids, and allowing people to eat regular food as uh, soon as they can tolerate it. And so the ERAS Society um, was established in 2010 in Europe, and it's, it's really on these kind of simple, pragmatic things that they, they um, hang their hat. And one of the things that they often say is that the immediate challenge to improving the quality of surgical care is not discovering new knowledge, but rather how to integrate what we already know into practice. And a lot of people have had a lot of interest in this over the last 20 years. Um, and you can see there are many, many, many ERA Society endorsed guidelines now. And so as more and more people have uh, adopted ERAS. I'm sure many of you work in hospitals that have ERAS and a lot of these practices may have um, entered into what you do on a daily routine as well. Um, there is some um, scope creep and a little bit of confusion about what, what is the actual ultimate goal. Um, and so I give various ERAS talks, you know, to all different kinds of surgeons and anesthesiologists all over the place. And I always ask them and oftentimes I hear that ERAS reduces complications. You get better coordinated teamwork to reduce complications. And I think that's admirable and obviously extremely important, but that's really why hospitals have patient safety programs. I often hear that it decreases length of stay. Um, absolutely, this is important. The more patients we can get through the hospital, the more backfill opportunity we have, the more we can operate, the more we can help. Um, length of stay is very easy to measure. And so it's often the primary outcome in ERAS literature. But this is really just an enhanced discharge program. It's not ERAS. Not so interesting to us, it's ILIAS, but my God, general surgeons love talking about poop and ILIAS. Um, also enhanced discharge program. Reducing narcotics, this is so important. And ERAS has been shown over and over again in various different specialties um, that uh, using multimodal analgesia can reduce narcotics. 
Um, however, we all have opioid stewardship programs now. Saving money makes care more efficient um, and get, pe get people home sooner. Yes, of course, but this is just a finance program. And really what ERS is to me and to other leaders in the field is something to help patients recover. And all of these other programs that already exist at your hospitals may be able to use ERAS as a vehicle to achieve their goals. But the heart of ERAS is really helping patients recover. Um, and hopefully you get some of these other benefits along the way. And so here, this is just the same schematic, but it's in my nice Carolina blue. Um, we spend a lot of effort at uh, Carolina trying to implement ERAS. We've got 20 different surgical divisions who are on ERAS pathways, and we've started to expand our program to um, different hospitals in our system. And we've done a pretty good job during surgery and post-surgery at uh, forming teams, and we've started to see some better outcomes. Um, and that's because you have to have data. Um, it does feel really good to create an ERAS team and to understand um, everybody's competing interests and to align, except if you're not measuring what you're doing, then you're not really doing ERAS. Um, I've worked very hard as the director of our program to get this flashy dashboard created. And this allows us to look at every single surgical division at all of the different hospitals uh, across the UNC system that participate in ERAS to see how many cases they've done, uh, the percent uh, adherence to their pathway measures and how that relates to their readmission rate, their outcomes and their length of stay. Um, it turns out anytime there's a change of faculty every July when we get new trainees um, or if folks just miss a few of the data reporting meetings, um, we always have a drop in adherence. So it really does take active, constant, continuous attention and quality improvement to have uh, an ERAS program. Um, so uh, what is happening with ERAS and vascular surgery? Um, ERAS started in colorectal surgery, and um, now it's expanded significantly, but the, uh, the divisions um, that have the most experience with ERAS are all major abdominal um, types of operations. And so it certainly uh, would be useful for us in open aortic surgery, whether that's for aneurysms or, or occlusive disease. And I'd say it's also really relevant in lower extremity bypass also. You can see here this data is about five years old, but I don't think much has changed. This is 30-day readmission rates and length of stay uh, following surgery in Medicare population. And you can see here on the side of the screen that 15% of our lower extremity bypass patients uh, are readmitted for an unplanned reason. And that's after a median length of stay of four days. And they only come back 10 days later. And so to me, um, all of these other bariatrics, colectomy, ventral hernias, hysterectomies, uh, total joints, they all have ERS pathways and their readmission rates combined are, are equal to ours. Um, obviously, we've got a pretty frail patient population, but there's also a lot of data that says that readmissions disproportionately affects uh, minorities. Um, and so I think that with better education, better trusting relationships, um, and better coordination of care, we can transition a lot of the care that we do to outpatient and avoid some of these readmissions. And there's a lot of growth that can be had in this population. So where are our guidelines? Um, a couple of years ago, the ERAS Society along with ERAS USA and the Society for Vascular Surgery um, formed um, a, a formal uh, alliance and appointed a writing group this writing group includes surgeons, anesthesiologists, advanced practice providers um, from across North America and Europe. And um, it has been a real pleasure to be a part of this group. Um, it was really interesting to like watch the COVID wave like come across the world because at various parts of the process in the last year, um, people have had to duck out and then um, come back based on what their COVID census was. Um, Hopefully, no one else will ever have to have a writing group experience in the middle of the pan pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, um, a lot of progress has been made and the ERAS guidelines for open aortic surgery have been submitted and are now currently with the executive boards of these societies for approval and I hope that they will be published this summer. Um, by winter time, there should also be a guideline for lower extremity bypasses and major limb amputation. 
So we're making progress and hopefully this will um, help each of you who are interested in ERES programs. Um, and then some other good news is that, of course, we all have outcomes data galore. Um, sometimes a little bit too much outcomes data, honestly. And we get a lot of feedback from a lot of different groups about the things that we need to do to improve. Um, but I'm very proud to let you know that the VQI has made a strong commitment with the SVS to make sure to include guideline uh, recommended practices in the registry. And for aortas and infraringual bypass modules, this upcoming year in their new release will also include a lot of the ERAS elements. And so you'll be able to track adherence to major ERAS elements at the same time as you track your outcomes. Um, if you don't want to wait for all of that and you want to get a start uh, thinking about how you can uh, employ ERAS in your patient population at your hospitals, um, there is some nascent literature available. Uh, this is a systematic review that I wrote that primarily reviews aortic surgery, which is really all that's been studied in vascular patients at this point. Most of that work has been done in Europe, but I think you'll find some interesting things here. In addition to that, there was a pilot study for a enhanced recovery after surgery protocol and aortic surgery just published a couple of months ago. This is also a group from Europe, but they have a really nice implementation uh, plan in this uh, journal article and it's quite modern and uh, easily translatable. University of Alabama just published uh, their Im implementation plan for a lower extremity bypass model. And there's also uh, information available about enhanced recovery plans for major limb amputation. And so I think there's a lot of information that you can get here. And if you have any other further questions, um, by all means, I'm willing to share. Um, despite having that really fancy, flashy dashboard, um, I have also found for, for instance, my major limb amputation ERAS patients, a plain old piece of paper to tape onto the computer that's in each of the patient's room uh, really helps. And this just has our ERAS pathway day by day, bullet by bullet, um, spelled out clearly. And so that way when the patient goes in to check on the patients and to document, they can quickly see and make sure that they're adhering to all of the things that we think are best practice. This has been really helpful for us, even though it's just a piece of paper taped to the wall. I'm happy to share this with you. Additionally, we've got some printed paper brochures that we keep on the different nursing units and pass out in clinic um, that lets patients really know what to prepare for and what to expect. One thing that I never would have known had I not gone through the process of a, building a multidisciplinary ERAS team is that my patients who were getting major limb amputation thought that they would be staying in the hospital until they got their prosthetic. Um, obviously, that's months and that's never happened once, but that's something that I wouldn't have known is a common misconception if I hadn't actually spoken with the nurse managers. And so there's a lot of stuff that we were able to put together to help patients understand what they need to do before their surgery, what was going to happen to them during surgery and then after surgery, what they should expect and how they should get themselves and their homes prepared uh, with different durable medical equipment and such. Um, and so that is a kind of an overview of what ERAS is and what we've done in vascular surgery and what you can do in vascular surgery. Um, and I really want uh, to spend the second half uh, telling you more about why this actually matters to me and how I became motivated to become the director of the ERAS program and to get involved with the leadership of the ERAS society. And it has a lot more um, to do with big picture public health things, um, which is part of my background. But it's also about my personality. Um, and so this is an Enneagram. I encourage all of you guys to Google it. It's a personality style test and it's pretty fun to read through. Um, I am a strong eight. Um, for those of you who know me, this is no surprise to you that I tend to lead with my gut. I'm a woman of action. I like direct plans. Um, that makes me a great leader. It makes me a great surgeon. Turns out it also makes me intimidating. I was well into my 30s before I knew that I was intimidating. Um, but that is a real clear part of my personality. In direct contrast to me are the twos. 
Twos are people who really lead with their heart. They share their emotions publicly. Um, they're givers, they're helpers, they're nurturers. These are wonderful nurses. But on the flip side, they're also manipulators. And so here I am coming to work every day, thinking I'm doing a great job leading these teams, intimidating the heck out of everybody who are then in turn manipulating me to get what they want anyway. Um, also it turns out that 50% of men say that they're in the top 15%. I'm sure you know a vascular surgeon or two who has some ego. And so with all of that, not to mention all of this, quite frankly, it's kind of exhausting uh, to be at work some days. It's like landmines everywhere. And that's not really the way it should be. That doesn't feel good to me. And so to me, ERAS is about flow. And this is a slide from one of the cardiac surgeons that I work with here at UNC. Dr. Tommy Karanasos is a sharpshooter. He actually went to the Olympics in biathlon and he loves giving talks about sports psychology and how he translates that into surgical practice. And he really talks about achieving the state of flow. And so what this means is when, when you de develop a skill, you come into work each day and you do that thing. And, you know, depending on whatever external or internal influences, you may or not, may not perform well. And you may or may not be performing in uh, concert with the people around you. When you're actually given meaningful tasks and you identify as being part of a team, then your identity gets caught up in your performance and you're more likely to perform at a higher level and in concert with the other people at your team. But you really have to commit to analyzing your performance, doing better, making changes, doing quality improvement, to really get your peak performance. And this is when everybody shows up to work regardless of their personalities or what happened the night before and knows what to do and how to perform. This is when you're like the pit crew in a Formula One race and you align knowledge and action with identity to improve performance. Being in this environment is phenomenal. It doesn't happen every day, but when it does, it's really, really great. And then you get things like this. This is a man named George Alston I cut this man's leg off and he literally told me, you are the best doctor I've ever had. Now, I will tell you, I do a pretty good limb amputation, but it had nothing to do with me and the limb amputation. It had everything to do with my ERAS team and making sure that he felt cared for and that he understood what was going to happen and that he had time to speak with other amputees. He had time to talk with the prosthetist. Um, and then you get this. You're the best doctor I've ever had, even though you just took my leg. So what, what should we be aiming for? How can we all get this? And I think obviously infrastructure to support optimal care is important. Having a hospital system and administration that can help support you and align uh, nursing priorities with surgical and anesthesia priorities is important. And then having some way by which you can do process measurement to facilitate quality improvement is also very important, obviously. And so there's this model called the Donabedian model, and this is a kind of a conceptual framework for measuring healthcare. And at the bottom here is structures. And so you have to have the structures in place to be able to do anything in healthcare, right? We've got to be able to turn the lights on in the OR and have, you know, all of the perioperative um, space and employees that we need. But this is also why for all of our divisions that have ERES programs, I make sure that we've identified a key leader who's the person with the ultimate responsibility, as well as then a surgical champion, an anesthesia champion, a nursing champion. And there's a, a team that needs to meet regularly to review their data and to identify problem areas. This is just fundamental structure. And when you get that, then you can start working on processes and you can make sure that people are aligning themselves to do the multidisciplinary care in a way that makes sense. And you can start measuring process compliance. And once you get that down, then you can start thinking about your outcomes and ideally your outcomes performance. And with this right structures and processes in place, there's no reason why you can't design uh, care pathways that then improve your performance. And in fact, in places that have a long history of doing ERAS, the literature shows that ERAS does provide positive impacts and you can improve performance. 
There's significant reduction in complications associated with the stress of surgery in colorectal patients across Europe and the United States. ERAS has shortened the length of stay by 30 to 50% over standard care. Intermountain Health out in the western part of our country reported a reduction of almost $2,000 per case for colorectal ERAS patients. And so all of these things are so important and they really help drive our healthcare system. But to me, I'm not sure that this is what we should really be aiming for. This stuff is all important and um, I'm happy to be a part of it, but it's not what keeps me ticking. Um, because as I said at the beginning, ERAS is really what matters to the patient and how we can optimize outcomes that matter to the patient so they can recover. And I double down and I challenge you that ERAS can also help achieve access for everyone. And this is what I mean by that. So um, patients are really our partners. And I think that we spend most of our time at the bottom half of this Venn diagram. And if COVID has taught me anything, it's that this top circle is a lot more important than I've ever thought. Over the course of the last year, we pretty much lost trust in all of our federal institutions. We had a PPE shortage at this April of last year. I was worried about whether or not I was gonna die going to work. Um, honestly, I'm very lucky. I've never had a major operation. I've never had to really worry about my own mortality um, until last March. And even with a very, very small chance of that, I mean, I was a little bit paralyzed. I didn't know how my family would be affected. Um, and you know, in the end, I just didn't really work normally for a couple of weeks but my entire world was turned upside down. And I think that's what happens to patients when they have to undergo a major unexpected vascular operation. And then all of a sudden they can't work for months potentially. Um, and there's all of this fear of the unknown, not to mention fear of death. And I think also what uh, the, the pandemic has taught us is that the, the inequity in care is just mind boggling and the mistrust in the healthcare system is mind boggling. The disparities um, and the racism and the sexism that are kind of coming to the fore in our country are incredibly important. And I'm not gonna tell you that ERS is gonna solve all of those problems, but when you standardize care and you minimize the variation, then it's much more likely that vulnerable populations will be treated the same um, as those who um, historically do better. And if all of that bleeding heart stuff does not uh, get you, then ERS is also part of the value equation. And I think that this is really important. Um, it kills me a little bit that we were even in the PPE situation that we were in this past year. And I think that from my perspective, that's driven by a lot of greed and uh, decisions made for short-term benefit. I think that there's some preposterous idea that hospitals should be run like Amazon distribution centers. And for years and years and years, we've been asked to work harder with a little less, a little less, a little less. Um, and ERAS really makes it that we can provide increased value to our patients without having to skimp and without having to work harder. We just work smarter. And here's another uh, conceptual model. This is called the Iron Triangle of Healthcare. And the theory here is that you cannot have improvements in access costs and quality at the same time. And so for example, if you want to increase the amount of access that people have to healthcare, then the cost has to go up or the quality has to decrease. And I would argue that ERAS here is the disruptive innovator because ERAS makes the system more efficient. And so you can have shorter length of stay, more backfill opportunity for more access for surgical patients. It decreases the cost because there is less overlap and less unnecessary care. And because you're working in teams and you're standardizing care, there's higher quality as well. And this is really important because we know, this is no surprise to anybody that healthcare costs in the United States continue to outstrip all other developed countries. The cost of health insurance is increasing dramatically every year. In 2018, it was $20,000 a year. Insurance premiums are growing faster than wages. 
but deductibles are higher. And 40% of Americans before the pandemic didn't even have $400 to cover an emergency. Obviously, the stimulus checks have been very important this year. And 27% of patients have skipped medical treatment due to cost. And so I really, I think about this and I think about how nervous I was about getting sick or having to be in the hospital, heaven forbid, if I had been diagnosed with COVID. Um, and then I thought about the amazing amount of uh, wealth and benefits I have and um, how not having that as part of the things I had to worry about is really pivotal. Um, and I think we can't under, underscore that enough. And medical bills can cripple. There is currently over a quarter million GoFundMe pages for medical bills. This man, Dr. Lederman, an experimental physicist, sold his medal to pay for his medical bills at the end of life. 60% of uh, people who declare bankruptcy cite healthcare expenses as contributing to that. And 44% cite medical related work law, um, medically related loss of work. Like this is, this is awful. This is a huge problem. And I, and I don't have a plan for that. Um, I am very glad I'm not a politician and I don't have to have a full plan for that. But I do know that what I can do on a daily basis is participate in ERAS and make care more efficient and make my patients trust me and make my patients feel like they're getting the care that they need and they understand what to expect and to hopefully ultimately improve all of their outcomes and make them recovered. And so overall, in conclusion, for objective number one, the fundamentals of ERAS, there's a 20 year history. It's well established um, across many different surgical disciplines and there are many, uh, it's about 16 universal elements across all pathways, but there's still room for individualization. Um, all patients can benefit from elements of ERAS, even if they're not expected to be a fast track type patient. Um, there's more support and ideals available for you at the ERASUSA.org and also ERASSociety.org. This is where all of the guidelines are published. They also have a series of web webinars. And if you're really interested, you can join me in New Orleans this November for the ERASUSA Congress. Uh, objective two, the current state of vascular ERAS. Um, I'm sure many of you have already used ERAS principles and more support is on the way. The open aortic guidelines will be published this summer and ERAS compliance metrics will be embedded into the VQI if you are participants of that registry. And then finally, why it matters to me. ERAS matters because it promotes positive interactions between multiple different personalities and competing interests. It promotes quality and efficiency without demanding more from physicians. It improves access to care. And most importantly, it helps patients recover. Thank you so very much, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. McGinnigal. Very thought-provoking um, uh, topic, uh, and thank you so much for your leadership on discussing this. We have a few questions, but before we get started, let me ask you a question. So um, we all know that surgeons have personalities, and vascular surgeons, you know, have egos and personalities. Um, I struggle when I, mean, I talk to my colleagues about the, about the path phase or the protocols, because as you know, uh, surgeons are very fixated. And I've been doing open triple A's for X, Y, Z amount of years, and all my patients stay in bed for two days, and they, I don't feed them till post-op day gazillion, and it has worked for me, I will never change. How, how, at your institution, how were you able to, did you, first of all, did you encounter problems like this? I would say intellectual dilemmas, and if so, how were you able to convince your partners uh, to partner up with you? Yeah, so that's very common, right? And I think that everybody, regardless of specialty, who's gone through the process of ERAS um, struggles with this. And, you know, experience is very valuable. And there's reasons why we do things the way that we do, because it's historically worked for us. And so, um, for the aneurysm example, I had, um, you know, it, he, he was a relatively young patient. And so like I, I chose the patient wisely, but for the first person who I announced was like the aortic ERAS person that was going to be starting our work in this, 
um, I made sure to like take his NG tube out in the operating room and I let him drink fluids that day and I got him up and he was a, he was a prisoner. So he had to walk with shackles, but like I got him up and I walked him and I like, and he left the hospital on post update day three and like, thank God he didn't come back and he did really well. Um, and so I kind of proved that it could happen. And my senior partner said, okay, that's great. I'm not doing that. And, but, but what's happened though is now like a few years later is they have gotten a little more aggressive and the trainees are all used to it because now they've gone through, whether it's medical school or general surgery residency and other specialties with ERAS programs and they're used to a more aggressive um, diet orders and, um, and so now instead of waiting to let patients eat until like, you know, day bazillion, it's like, you know, day three. Um, and that's a big change and that, that matters. And as more of us do this and as more of us measure it, we can kind of figure out where the sweet spot is and when we should be letting people eat, for instance, after aortic surgery. Got it. So bottom line, we need to have champions in each institution. Um, yeah, it's all about having a champion. It's all about, you know, culture change really and making it comfortable for people to have culture change. Um, Got it. Thank you. Uh, so the first question I have is from Dr. DiMuzio uh, from Jefferson. So Dr. DiMuzio says, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read out his text loud. He said, thank you for a great talk. How often do you find that the patient because of the language uh, and cultural slash economic barriers has difficulty understanding the importance of the pathways you have set forth. And how do you deal with this problem? Yeah, so I think language barriers are definitely an issue. Um, and if you are in the situation where you have a, like a nurse educator or an APP or somebody in your clinic who can take the time with an interpreter, to go through a lot of the expectation setting before they come to the hospital, that really helps because then they've had time when they're not stressed to think about what's gonna be happening and what, um, what they're expected to do. Um, and then they have an easier time despite language barriers in the post-operative setting kind of moving along. And then some people are just not gonna do what you want them to do, right? And And that's, fine because you can deviate from a lot of the different measures um, but still get benefit from the ERS pathway overall. Um, you know, for instance, opioid sparing um, and using like regional blocks and epidurals, that helps everybody regardless of whether or not they're going to get out of bed. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tran. I'm sorry, did you want me to, to read yeah. my question? Uh, right. I mean, yeah, I, I, I thought, and I know you, you were interested in this topic, so I thought you were going to say something. Thank you, sorry. Um, so first off, I'd like to, to thank Kate for taking the time to, to educate us. Um, I thought she offered us a lot of insight. Um, I had a question regarding the beginning of your talk when you said that really ERAS is about essentially enhanced patient recovery, making them recover better and I guess faster as well. Um, and then you went into a, a discussion of setting up a, um, a dashboard um, and had a bunch of metrics. Um, I guess my question is, is uh, the ultimate metric is, is how those patients recover faster or better. Um, is there a way to quantify that? Because everything else is a surrogate, right? It's a little bit like carotid disease where you're measuring a degree of stenosis, but you don't actually know what you want to know, which is how stable or unstable your plaque is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks for the really hard question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, right, this is true, right? And part of it is that, you know, we, we have, especially in vascular surgery, but I'd say no matter what the specialty is, that we haven't really studied the incremental effectiveness of different parts to know which are the most important parts of ERAS to the patient, right? And so I think 
you know, ultimately like patients don't care if they leave the hospital on like post-op day three versus post-op day seven after an aneurysm repair. They just want to know that they're going to be alive in six months and able to play with their kids and grandkids um, and not have to worry about their aneurysm rupturing, right? So like these metrics that we often use are not meaningful. There's not been a lot of patient reported outcomes related to this, but the, the patient reported outcome studies that exist um, they always come back to um, reducing the fear of the unknown. And that is really important for patients. And so not just like, you know, what I do is I, you know, draw a little picture of an aneurysm on a piece of paper and then I show where you're going to cut. And um, they all want to know more about like, you know, what is my life going to be like and how are you going to make sure that I'm not hurting in the hospital and things like that. And so short of doing a bunch of qualitative patient reported outcome studies, um, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but in general, if you can keep all of the other administrative things in line and you can reduce length of stay and you can reduce patient safety events and you can um, you know, reduce readmissions and all of these other things, then I think only at that point can we really get to the next level of outcome measures um, you know, which is quality of life and survival. Um, Got it. So basically what you're saying is that this is the, the platform by which we are going to build. And then from there, we can start to, to be more in depth and to really integrate, you know, newer components to figure out what's going to get the patients the, the best outcome. Yeah. And the best outcome that they want, that they feel good about. Mm -hmm. sure. sure. Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience at all? All right. In that case, we'll we'll get started with our. Um, sorry. Okay. We'll start. Guess we'll keep we'll keep going with our program. Um, a bit. Uh, hold on one second. All right. So before we jump on to a rapid fire session, um, I will um, I would like to remind all of attendees that after the presentations are over, we will have a poll for you to vote your favorite paper overall. To make sure that we can count the votes later on, I'm going to ask you right now to text uh, uh, the code event polls to the number shown on the screen. And uh, or you can use a, uh, a uh, internet browser uh, on the web to do that. Uh, since we have eleven presentations, perhaps the best way we have figured out is to is to uh, uh, is to uh, is to uh, find your best song here. Vote for this, and um, let me do that myself as well in a second. <laughs> Yes, if everyone can please vote two times, because you will be voting two times at the end of the night as well. So you have two votes you can do right now. So a uh, question, is it for, for, for number one and number two presentations or? Yes, I would vote for your top two at the end of the night. Okay. And then we'll compile all the scores for the uh, winner. For clarification purposes, uh, what we're doing is that uh, the numbers are by the number of the presentation, correct? That's correct. So paper one will be number one, paper 11 will be number 11. And it looks like Hey Jude is way in the lead and nobody likes I can't get no up. Oh, there's the I can't get no satisfaction. Um. Uh, so I'm having trouble. So I went, I, I texted the number, so I get a text back. What am I supposed to do next? Now you can, uh, after you've got the text back that you've joined, you can select your top two songs. So you can uh, okay. just, just text the number one, two, three, or four. So I, I pick, for example, one. It and bounces then. back to me. It says it only works after you join the presenter section. Okay, got it. Yeah, so you have to type event polls, one word to the number 22333, yeah. that means you've joined and then you have two chances to vote. Yeah, so I did that. So I'm, so I'm just, I'm saying enough, so anybody else- And yours, bounce it back. Me back. It says it only works after you've joined a presenter session. Uh, and did you text event polls as one word? Uh, no, hold on. 
written an event call. Plural. Uh-huh. Um. And once you've done a test vote now, at the end of the night, you will not have to text the, the uh, event polls code. You'll be already logged in and ready to just vote your top two papers. Um, okay, I don't think I got it right. So it's the same word and not different words, correct? Yes, one word event polls with an S at the end. Event polls. It actually looks like, and uh, looks like, let me just reopen, it looks like there was a timer that stopped your votes. So let me clear and let me just let you try one more time, Dr. Aziz. If anyone can please try again, if you are having problems, it looks like the, the uh, poll locked itself out. So okay. here we go. I apologize. It's okay, let me try one more time. Then polls. I'm going to pay number 11. Let me double check for a second. There's number here. Okay. I think it went through. All right. Great. Sounds Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So uh, let's get started. Our uh, for just a reminder, every, present, every presenter has three minutes for the presentation and two minutes for Q&A. To start off, the first uh, presenter is Dr. Lily Sadry from Bankton Jefferson Health System, and she will present on the topic of enhanced recovery after surgery protocol decreases the use of, use of post-bypass narcotics. Dr. Sadry? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to present. My name is Lily Sadri. I'm from Abington Jefferson Health, and I'll be speaking on our hospital's uh, experience with the ERAS protocol. Um, my talk is titled, an, an ERAS protocol decreases the use of post-bypass narcotics. I have nothing to disclose. So I won't belabor the point here as Dr. McGinnigal gave a very nice talk. Thank you for that. Um, but I'd like to emphasize that there is not much written out there for vascular surgery and ERAS. And therefore the aim of, my, of our study was to determine if using an ERAS protocol for lower extremity bypass surgery improved pain control and morbidity after surgery. So our primary outcome was pain control um, and the secondary outcomes are listed here. We compared patients that received an ERAS protocol and had lower extremity bypass surgery from July 2020 to March 2021. And these patients were compared to patients before this era um, from July 2016 to July 2020. Our pain medication order set is listed here. Um, in the post-anesthesia care unit, when patients were uh, alert enough to swallow oral medications, they were given a cocktail of gabapentin, acetaminophen, and tramadol, assuming they had no seizure history for the tramadol. And these medications were continued throughout their hospitalization. Um, oxycodone was prescribed on an as-needed basis, as well as ketorolac. Here is our ERAS protocol, and I appreciate that this slide is a little bit busy, and I um, welcome being able to talk about it at the end of my presentation, but it is divided out by phase of care and um, by organ system. Here are our results. We had 114 patients in our pre-ERAS group and 45 patients in our ERAS group. Um, the, as far as demographics are concerned, the patients were similar. Um, there was a significant difference with patients with chronic kidney disease with those in the ERAS group have, being less likely for having chronic kidney disease. As far as pain control was concerned, patients in the ERAS group received less fentanyl intraoperatively, received significantly less in terms of oral narcotics, and did not receive patient controlled analgesia pumps or IV narcotics. Below, be beneath that, the um, rows demonstrate post-operative pain scores, which are from one to 10, one being 
let no pain and 10 being the most pain. At 12 hours after surgery, patients in the ERAS group reported that subjectively they had significantly less pain than those in the pre-ERAS group. And at discharge, there was non-inferiority between the groups. Furthermore, the duration of surgery was shorter and there was no significant difference between the length of stay for these patients. Therefore, in conclusion, a vascular surgery ERAS protocol improves post-operative pain control compared to those with a more liberalized narcotic medication regimen. It reduces the amount of oral narcotics patients receive. It eliminates IV narcotic use altogether, and it reduces intraoperative fentanyl administration and procedure times. I'd like to thank the society for the opportunity to present um, and my mentor, Dr. Danielle Panetta for her support in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandri. Uh, great presentation. Uh, one question for you. Um, did you notice any difference in the post-operative outcomes, most specifically in the risk of any um, uh, incident, any change in the incidence of unplanned readmissions after the procedure between these two groups? Um, so the unplanned readmissions related to the surgeries um, were there was no significant difference between the groups, um, but you know unrelated to our surgeries, the rates are are still measurable. I mean, we we did have readmissions related to these patients' baseline comorbid conditions, which oftentimes we see with vascular surgery patients in general. Got it. But any difference between these two groups at all? No. Okay. Thank you. All right, so our next presenter is Dr. Anand Terpara from Thomas Jefferson University, and he'll be presenting on the topic of TR first approach to debate type 1 aortic dissection with mesenteric, renal, and lower extremity malperfusion. Dr. Terpara? Yes, thank you. Oh, I think I'm having some problems now. It's not letting me share. Give me one second. Yeah, if you click the share screen button at the bottom. It's, uh, it's not letting me share for some reason. I have to like quit and reopen. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Aziz, do you want to move forward yeah. one and we can come back? Yeah, awesome. let me come back. Let's do that. All right, next presenter is Dr. Amrina Chima from Albert Einstein, who will be presenting on the topic of surgical treatment of a right subclavian and nominate artery aneurysm using a hybrid approach. Dr. Chima. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Amrina Chima. I'm one of the residents at Einstein Medical Center. I would like to thank the Society and Dr. Trani for the opportunity to present today. Oh, there we go. I will be presenting a case um, talking about the surgical treatment of a right subclavian and innominate artery aneurysm using a hybrid approach. Our patient is a 79-year-old male with a history of multiple myeloma that was stable from being treated with medical therapy and a distant history of trauma to the right uh, clavicle from an, from an MVC who had a right, known right subclavian and innominate artery aneurysm. Uh, we, he's well known to our office for many years and we were following the aneurysm with serial CAT scans but for a period of time the patient was lost to follow up and then ultimately uh, returned to the office for his surveillance. At this point we noted that there had been gradual growth of the aneurysm to 6.3 centimeters uh, however the patient had remained asymptomatic. This is the CAT scan from the preoperative. Uh, this is the most recent CAT scan from the preoperative time period. Uh, and I would just bring your attention to the right common carotid artery. And as we go more proximally, we see that there is a large aneurysm uh, kind of at the confluence of the subclavian and common carotid arteries into the innominate artery. I would then bring your attention to the arch here where there is a common origin of the left common carotid and the innominate arteries consistent with a bovine arch. 
Um, again, here shown in the orange, green, and blue arrows are the involved vessels, uh, uh, indicating the innominate, the subclavian, and common carotid, the right common carotid arteries, respectively. So at this point, we were talking to the patient about intervention, given obviously the size of the aneurysm and the risk for thrombosis and subsequently embolization. embolization. We discussed with him uh, the standard approach, which would be immediate, which would require immediate sternotomy for open reconstruction. However, the patient was very adamantly opposed to this option. Um, so at this point, we started discussing endovascular methods to treat the aneurysm and probably somewhat of a hybrid approach, given that the aneurysm extends into the confluence of the um, carotid and subclavian arteries. The approach that was chosen was to perform a light, left to right carotid carotid artery bypass with an eight millimeter PTFE graft. Uh, we then constructed a right axillary conduit to deploy the stent graft uh, from the arm. Um, and the primary reason for making this decision as opposed to going transfemoral was the bovine arch anatomy and we thought that that would make things a little bit more challenging. Um, we were then able to deploy first a uh, first the um, graft from the subclavian into the innominate, and then extend into the uh, essentially the mid innominate artery with a 20 millimeter piece. These are some of the intraoperative images. This is the angiogram prior to placement of the stent. And then here I would bring your attention to the innominate artery, the aneurysm. This is actually the, the carotid carotid bypass, which had been created first. Here is the native common carotid artery, which at this point in this image has not been ligated yet. And here is, of course, the subclavian artery. After stent deployment, this is the next aortogram. Uh, we can see that the, uh, the aneurysm is excluded. However, there is delayed filling of the sac, and it seems to be primarily from the vertebral artery. We characterize this as a type 2 endoleak and decided to treat it as such uh, without doing any additional intervention at that time, choosing to monitor it on his serial um, CT scan. The patient had an uneventful postoperative recovery and has followed up in the office. And here is his postoperative CT. Again, I would bring your attention to the right common carotid artery. Here we see the carotid carotid bypass. And then here we see the aneurysm sac with a little bit of contrast um, in the sac, consistent with, again, a type 2 endoleak. This time uh, we were able to trace, and it's not actually from the vertebral artery, which has since thrombosed, but actually from this branch, which if traced more distally would be seen to come off of the axillary artery. Um, however, the sac size has remained stable. And here I just wanted to point out that the vertebral artery on this side has actually thrombosed um, and there's maintained patency on the other side. So this case represents um, the use of a hybrid method to, as an alternative to the treatment of uh, subclavian and innominate artery aneurysm. I think very important to our management plan was you know, the management of the vertebral artery, and one has to consider the status of the contralateral vertebral artery when planning to do uh, stent graft coverage. We did do a preoperative uh, diagnostic thoracic angiogram just to make sure that everything was patent on the other side before um, making the plan to cover the vertebral on the right side. Uh, the, this method, the, the use of stent grafts in general has been described in the past for patients who uh, may, not, uh, may, not be, may not be not be suitable and it has pretty good um, graft patency and technical success rates. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Archima. I just we just heard a case, uh, but we did it open. Uh, question for you: So this stent graft appeared to be an iliac limb of an end of an aortic endograft. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. My other question is that: So what's the long-term plan? There is a small type two endoleak. 
what, what's yeah. the plan if aneurysm keeps getting bigger down the road? Uh, what will you do next? Yeah, our plan at this point is to, in, the immediate plan is to s perform surveillance and uh, reassess with another CAT scan in about a month. If there was to be SAC expansion, we have discussed that that uh, area is probably accessible uh, such that it could be treated um, uh, endovascularly with coils if needed. Um, but, you know, again, the discussion we've had multiple times too is that the primary goal was to treat the aneurysm and prevent embolization um, and, and obviously rupture as well. But the bigger concern was to prevent um, thrombosis and embolization down the extremity. Um, but yes, if there was an increase in the sac size, we would have to consider intervention of that branch. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Dr. Megan Dermody has a question and she's asking, did you uh, have neuro monitoring during the case? Given this? Was a, that was an evening decision, um, surgeon preference, but no, we did not have it during the case. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, Dr. Terpara, are you ready? Yes. All right, sounds good. Go ahead. All right, can everyone see okay? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll be prevent, presenting a TR first approach to the biggie type 1 aortic dissection in a patient with mesenteric renal and lower extremity malperfusion. My name is Anand Tarpar, I'm a vascular surgery fellow at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Uh, the patient's a 40-year-old male that presented to an outside hospital initially with intense chest pain radiating to the back. He had a CT angiogram that demonstrated a complex type 1 aortic dissection from the aortic root down to the left common femoral artery. He was transferred to our facility for higher level of care. Uh, he mentioned not taking his blood pressure medication because he ran out a few days prior to his presentation. On arrival to our facility, he had blood pressure controlled with two IV antihypertensives. And on physical exam, he had a right leg without any palpable or doperable signals. And his abdominal exam remained soft and non-peritonitic. This is his uh, CT scan that he arrived to our facility with. And it demonstrates a uh, dissection originating in the aortic root extending into the innominate and left subclavian arteries with a bovine arch. And then as you can uh, see the true lumen being severely compressed by the false lumen. And then when you get to the celiac artery, you can appreciate the dissection extends into the celiac artery with occlusion of the splenic artery. And then into the SMA, which appears nearly occluded by the, by the dissection flap. And then the false lumen filling the left renal artery. And then right at the aortic bifurcation, there's an occlusion at the origin of the right common iliac artery with the dissection extending down the left iliac and into the common femoral artery. This is a sagittal view highlighting the same thing. So you can follow the dissection going up. And then at the SMA appears nearly occluded. So cardiac surgery evaluated the, uh, the patient and reviewed the films and deemed the patient too high risk for an ascending repair emergently due to the visceral malperfusion and the lower extremity malperfusion. So uh, they called the, us as the vascular team for evaluation. And our surgical plan, given that he was too high risk for his cardiac repair uh, and without intervention, he'd have a poor outcome. Our intention was to expand the true lumen to restore perfusion to the viscera and the renal right lower extremity with a endovascular intervention. So our, our approach began with a percutaneous access to the right common femoral artery. We then verified true lumen placement uh, with the intraoperative TEE. And then we obtained an aortogram. And this shows uh, the bovine arch as well as filling of the true and false lumens. We then, uh, Advanced our, we used a Cook Alpha endograph measuring 36 by 181, and this is our pre-deployment uh, picture. We then deployed this at zone three of the aorta, just uh, distal to the left subclavian artery. We then shot a completion aortogram uh, distally, which showing no filling of the celiac SMA or the left renal artery. We then deployed a bare metal dissection stent measuring 36 by 161 millimeters. And then we coat a balloon the overlap between the uh, 
aortic endograft and the bare metal dissection stent. We then shot a completion aortogram. Again, no filling of the celiac SMA or the left renal arteries. So we then selectively catheterized the SMA with a glide wire and a glide catheter. Verified it was in the true lumen. And because this, this section was so extensive down the SMA, we placed a bare metal stent six by 40 millimeter uh, distally to avoid covering uh, jejunal branches and then bridged it into the true lumen with an ICAST stent measuring uh, six by 22 millimeter. And this is the bare uh, completion air to, uh, arteriogram. We then did the same for the celiac artery and used a 10 by 38 ICAST stent and uh, uh, expanded the true lumen into the aorta and the celiac artery. The splenic artery still does, didn't fill, but the, you could see the hepatic artery was uh, filling. We then did the, we then advanced the glide catheter into the false lumen. As you can see, the left renal still wasn't filling. And on here, we have a glide catheter in the false lumen, which highlighted the origin of the left renal artery. We then stented it with an ICAST stent, uh, seven by 22 into the true lumen of the aorta. And then here was our completion aortogram showing everything filling through the true lumen. This was the, three days later, he went for his cardiac repair. And uh, here's highlighting the innominate repair, then the left carotid, and then the innominate vein anteriorly. And then behind that was the left subclavian and then the uh, distal anastomosis and the aortic root there. This was a follow-up one month CTA showing the uh, filling of the celiac SMA and the dissection still extending down the left iliac artery. He was discharged on post-op day 14 to rehab. This was an article that highlighting uh, a TVAR first approach back in 2014 and uh, describing mortality rates in the literature with mesenteric malperfusion up to 75%. And in conclusion, Debakey type one aortic dissection with visceral malperfusion is a lethal diagnosis that requires immediate attention and a TVAR first strategy can be utilized to treat prior to ascending aorta repair in a hemodynamically stable patient, knowing that there's still risk of rupture, extension into coronary vessel and ultimately potentially death. Other management options described in literature include open repair with anti-grade TVAR uh, surgical debranching and zone zero TVAR, and as I described, a TVAR first approach, which was successful in this patient. These are the references. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for nice case presentations. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Uh, of all the medical diagnoses uh, in our textbooks, the classic teaching is the type A dissection is associated with uh, one person increase per hour. It's one of very few diagnoses which have a time limit to it, right? Yeah. And the classical teaching is type one dissection, the risk of mortality goes up by, by 1% per hour. Uh, and it's not due to, to, to visceral malperfusion, it's usually either due to cardiac tamponade or coronary ischemia. So uh, what are your thoughts about that? Because this intervention, I'm glad it worked, it's, it's a good, there are case reports for that. It doesn't take away the fact that it delayed the management of type A dissection by, by three days, right? Which is right. to 75% mortality. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's, it's a risky, it's still a risky procedure we did, but I feel like if we didn't do anything, he was bound to have a poor outcome clinically. And it was kind of a Hail Mary in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, one could argue doing, doing um, 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 you know, um, type A first and then uh, this one table do the, the reperfuse estimate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of questions, a lot of questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll go one by one. Number one, uh, Dr. Uh, Emmanuel uh, Navachuku. I'm sorry if, I'm, if I butchered up your name. I'm sorry for that. Uh, the question is, uh, did you use IBIS? Uh, no, we did not. This we did this in the we didn't have readily readily available access to IVIS. We did this around midnight on a Monday night, okay. Uh, and the whole case took about an hour and a half. So, uh, but we did not have readily accessible IVIS. Got it. 
Dr. Matthew Doherty is asking, when you uh, when you stent graft the distal to the entry tear, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're able to displace the false lumen effectively, are you not risking the proximal extension of, uh, extension of the dissection when you're eliminating the re-entry path? That's certainly um, a worrisome concern. And um, I, I think because the dissection started almost at the essentially at the aortic root, I feel like it, it was less likely to happen in this particular case, but if the tear was more distal in zone zero or zone one or zone two, that's certainly a, a higher risk thing to do to deploy this endograft at zone three. Last question uh, from Dr. Jose Trani. Why did cardiac surgery wait for three days for, for repair? Uh, that, I believe, they were concerned, uh, they wanted him to kind of settle out for the, from the T-VAR. And I believe on post-op day one from our intervention, uh, he had uh, some chest pain uh, in the middle of the day. So they repeated a CTA to reassess the uh, dissection proximally. Mm -hmm. And it appeared stable at that time. So um, it's just the way it played out. Uh, yeah. A great case. Uh, thank you so much for presenting. Great thank case. You. As you can see, it stirred up a lot of questions. Okay, this is a little, uh, you know, uh, unconventional. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Daniela Medina. Daniela is a medical student at uh, Penn State uh, College of Medicine, and she'll be presenting a topic on uh, presenting on a case report on endovascular repair for arterial artery aneurysm in a patient with Marfan syndrome. And due to my conflict of interest, I'll ask Dr. Truan to ask her questions. Thank you. Oh, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. My name is Daniela Medina, and I'm a fourth year medical student at Penn State. And today I'll be presenting a very interesting case describing the endovascular repair of a popliteal aneurysm in a patient with Marfan syndrome. So, our patient is a 72-year-old male with a history of Marfan syndrome. He underwent a thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair with subsequent um, uh, paraplegic as well as bilateral popliteal aneurysm repair, and he also had an aortic valve replacement and is currently on Coumadin. He presented to us the clinic where we saw that he had a pulsatile mass in the right medial thigh that ended up being a progressive aneurysmal degeneration of the uh, native SFA that extended all the way to the popliteal and measured up to 9.3 centimeters in diameter. So we went ahead and scheduled him for a right cut down for right SFA exposure as well as aneurysm stenting. So intraoperatively, we went ahead and prepped the entire right lower extremity just in case the case needed to be converted into open. And we did a vertical cut down for his uh, SFA exposure. We're able to uh, obtained vessel control, gave heparin, and then we inserted a sheath in the anterograde fashion, which allowed us to visualize or get this diagnostic um, angiogram that we see here, which confirms the aneurysm dilation. After that, we inserted an angle glide, uh, glide catheter over a glide, uh, over a glide wire, and then we used that to deploy the stents. So we had a total of three stents at the end. The first stent was a cover vivin stent that measured eight millimeters by 10 centimeters and was deployed in the inflow to the aneurysm and uh, the and and ended at the proximal portion of the vein graph. Distal to that, we deployed the second stent, which this time was a 10 millimeter by 10 centimeter vibin with a three centimeter overlap where we did a balloon angioplasty after that. And we're able to get this angiogram that we see right here, which shows that we were able to get the whole aneurysm area. However, we did have a type 1B endoleak that was not resolving with the balloon angioplasty. So we had to go back and insert our final and third uh, stent, which was a nine millimeter by five centimeter Vivin stent, distal to the two stents that we had before. And this time we did see that we had that resolution of the previous endoleak. After that, we made sure that we had audible uh, pulses, which we did. We removed the sheath, we closed the arteriotomy, and then we closed the cut down side. Um, the patient was discharged the next day without any overnight complications. He did, however, come back on post-operative day six for concerns for a right um, thigh hematoma. So we took him back to the OR on post-operative day seven, where we did a washout and evacuation of the hematoma and placed a 
a wound vac dressing, and he was discharged the same day on wound infection prophylaxis. Four months later, the patient is doing well, the incision has healed, and uh, the graft, I mean, the stent is pinned without any uh, evidence of significant stenosis. Now, this case is very interesting because um, there are currently no standard guidelines to treat this extra aortic aneurysms that we see in Marfan's patients uh, due to the fragility of their vessels. So this case shows that a purely endovascular approach can, it's a efficient option for this type of um, aneurysm. And lastly, I would like to thank uh, the vascular surgery department at Penn State for uh, their guidance throughout this case and mentorship. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, for a nice case presentation. Um, just one quick point of clarification. Um, was it an actual popliteal artery aneurysm or was it a vein bypass that uh, had aneurysmal degeneration? So the, it was the actual um, artery because he previously had a bypass that we can okay. see. Have the artery and then you had the bypass and the aneurysm started where the proximal anastomosis of that old bypass and then extend it from the SFA all the way to the popliteal. Okay, thank you. Um, so can you just walk us through the decision making in terms of an endovascular approach as opposed to an open repair? So, um, so for this patient specifically, he, um, for an open, so I'm, for an open approach, it's more invasive. This patient is, a, for this specific patient, he's a paraplegic. We didn't really want to do a very invasive procedure. And an endovascular approach offered us to touch on all those things that we talked about before. So it wasn't as invasive. Yes, it had its risks because, again, the vessels are so fragile. But at the same time, we had prepped everything for just in case we had to convert to open. Not sure if that answers the question. The point was to stay as um, right. less invasive as possible. Absolutely. Um, and the, the final question for that is, if you had to convert him to an open procedure, um, what was your plan B? Because in vascular surgery, everybody has to have a plan B. I'm guessing try to hold on to that vessel as much as you can. And uh, if just, I don't know. So I can answer it. So, uh, I mean, what happened was it's, it's, a, it's a 10 years old bypass, it's an end to side anastomosis. And with the passage of time, it opened up at the proximal anastomosis and it started to leak from the artery. So, our plan B was uh, if it doesn't go well, is to basically surgically ligate the aneurysm right, right at the anastomosis. That's the sure. Yep. Uh, I see that Dr. Caligaro asked a question why not do AKA, uh, interpretation is paraplegic. Very valid question, Dr. Caligaro. The answer is that he is uh, his paraparesis is perhaps the right word to use. He uses wheelchair outside the house, but inside the house is able to stand up and actually can walk inside the house very slowly. Uh, so limb uh, preservation was a big uh, was a big concern for him. That's why uh, we opted to repair it. All right, thank you, thank you, Daniela. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to the next presenter. Our next presenter is is uh, Dr. Devin uh, Fromer from Cooper uh, University Hospital. And uh, he will discuss the topic of concomitant TCAR and carotid subclavian transposition for multilevel disease. Dr. Fromer. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing me to present today. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so, oh, so I'm going to be talking about a 54 year old female who presented with arm claudication and ataxia. Past medical history is significant for hypertension, hyperlipidemia coronary disease, diabetes, hypothyroidism, cervical disc disease, anxiety, depression. She has a surgical history of stents in her left uh, circumflex and uh, a cholecystectomy, and she's a current everyday smoker. So initially she presented with left arm discomfort. This was chronic and thought to be secondary to her cervical disc disease. She then developed associated dizziness, um, which she characterized more specifically as unsteadiness. On exam, she had an absent left radial pulse compared to the right side and an arm blood pressure discrepancy between the two arms. The left side was 70 over 30, right was 138 over 75. This prompted workup with first an ultrasound showing 70 to 99% stenosis of the left internal along with monophasic flow through the left arm. 
and flow reversal of the left vertebral artery significant for steel. And this prompted a CTA. So it's going pretty fast, but um, you can see there that there's a proximal subclavian occlusion. I'll try to slow it down for everybody. So here you see proximally. Subclavian is out. You have reconstitution, patent vert. And then as we move up, you'll see the internal carotid disease. I'm not sure what happened there. Stand by, let me just back you up. Sure. All right, and this is just the, uh, an alternate view. So we elected to treat this patient uh, first with a carotid subclavian transposition, keeping in mind that she does have coronary disease and might need a uh, cabbage in the future and wanting to preserve the lima. So we were very careful uh, clamping uh, and ligating proximal to that. Once we completed our carotid subclavian transposition, we uh, elected to proceed with the T-car through the same incision. Um, and you can see here, this is pre-intervention angiogram and our post-intervention. And it was a very uh, um, nice approach because we were able to do the bypass as well as the T-car through the same incision. We just clamped proximal, uh, or just, excuse me, distal to our uh, bypass anastomosis and we were able to complete our T-car. Post-operatively, there were no complications. She was discharged on post-op day one and uh, was since seen in the office and her left arm claudication and dizziness has resolved. Thank you. Um, that's a very elegant solution to a, to a common problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess my te technical question is, so you did a transposition first. We did. Uh, how did you, how, where do you put the sheath? And uh, can you describe this? Where do you put the sheath and how do you do the T-car next? Yeah, yeah. So uh, everything was distal to our bypass, or, or, or sorry, our transposition. So that anastomosis was, was uh, more proximal, and then we clamped and put our sheath in distal to that. Distal to that anastomosis. Mm -hmm. Um, got it. Uh, other questions. So this person, if it needs, usually for patients who already have Lima bypass, it's preferable to do uh, carotid subclavian bypass and not transposition because it did not already have. Uh, uh, had had only had a stent. Did not already have a cabbage, so there was no concern that we were clamping any coronary flow. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Demuzi had a question. Mm -hmm. Nice job. In subclavian steel, fixing the high-grade carotid stenosis often is all one, uh, all one, one needs. Yes. What compelled you to do both? Uh, I think the fact that she was so young and her symptoms were really the arm and the dizziness, and and uh, um, we felt that this was going to be, you know, it was going to help resolve her arm claudication and those symptoms, as well as treat her asymptomatic stenosis. We really didn't want to have to bring her back in, in case she didn't have resolution of her symptoms. Okay. Uh, one more question from Dr. Don Salvatore. And the question, did you consider doing left common carotid subclavian bypass with TCAR? Uh, no, we, want, we elected for the transposition just because she had nice anatomy for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All righty. Our next presenter is Dr. Kelly Dowdy from uh, Pennsylvania Hospital presenting uh, on the topic of infected aorta, a minimally invasive versus maximally invasive approach. Dr. Dowdy. Thank you, let me share my screen. Uh, thank you, I will be presenting two cases of infected aortic pathology today, recently treated at Pennsylvania Hospital using very different techniques. Our first patient is a 73-year-old woman who came to our office with bilateral groin wounds. 
She had an extensive surgical history that did include aortal bifemoral bypass, as well as open revisions of her femoral limbs. On exam, she was stable, but she did have open draining wounds in both of her groins that were positive for STAP at B on culture. Her initial imaging showed extensive inflammatory changes around her proximal graft, as well as fluid collections and inflammatory changes around both of her distal limbs. Our operative approach for her consisted of, of complete graft excision, as well as in situ reconstruction with cryo artery. You can see our initial operative field with the infected Dacron graft here, our proximal cryo artery reconstruction here, and our bilateral groin reconstructions here. This did involve revascularization of both the deep and superficial femoral arteries. We also placed antibiotic beads throughout the operative field. Our second patient is an 84 year old woman who was transferred to us for an infected abdominal aortic pseudoaneurysm. She was extremely frail and had multiple cardiopulmonary comorbidities. When she came to us, she did have abdominal pain and she was bacteremic as well. Her imaging showed a saccular infrarenal aneurysm with extensive inflammatory changes, which you can see here. And you can see here again in the sagittal view. Because of her frailty, we did elect for an endovascular approach for her. You can see our initial operative imaging here with the outline of the aneurysm sac shown here. To begin, we selected the aneurysm sac with a catheter. We then positioned our stent graft and exchanged that catheter for a sheath. Prior to final inflation of our stent graft, we delivered antibiotic bead slurry into the aneurysm sac through the sheath. We then completed inflation of our stent graft. You can see our completion angiogram here, showing complete exclusion of the aneurysm. Both of these patients did well and were discharged within two weeks of their operations. At Pennsylvania Hospital, we do have a particular interest in infected aortic pathology and have published several papers on the topic. Our preferred approach is excision of all graft material with inside to cryo artery reconstruction. Even in a physically fit patient, this is a maximally invasive approach with significant associated morbidity. Endovascular solutions for these patients are becoming increasingly common and they're ideal solutions for patients who need to be temporized because they're unstable or for definitive treatment for very frail patients as seen in our second case. Other materials such as antibiotic beads have become common adjuncts for long-term infection control locally in these patients. We commonly use this technique during open surgery. To our knowledge, endovascular delivery of antibiotic bead material directly into an infected aneurysm sac is a novel approach and one that could make minimally invasive treatment of these patients even more useful. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, very nice presentations. And, uh, you know, clinically very difficult problem to solve. I have two questions. Number one, the second patient, Frail, how did you know it was infected? Um, she had a high white count. She was febrile and she was bacteremic. That coupled with her imaging findings suggested to us that this was an infectious process. Second question, for technique of endovascular, uh, 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 you know, flurry, antibiotic flurry that you placed, how did you do it? Do you deploy the proximal portion first, left the catheter behind, and then, then, then put the antibiotics after the, after the endographs were fully deployed? We had the sheath inside the aneurysm sac outside our deployed stent graft. The stent graft was deployed but not inflated. We inserted the slurry into the sac and then deployed our graft finally. So that was, that was how we did that. Okay. Um, uh, doctor, it's about another question from uh, Dr. Marcan, um, and it's about how long is the follow-up for each patient? These patients are both approximately three months out from their operations. We have the open patient we have seen several times in the office in follow-up, and she's doing wonderfully. The endovascular patient, uh, last we checked, is still in rehab, um, but recovering. Okay. Dr. Trani also wrote, also wrote that about follow-up question. He said, please publish that result with outcomes in JBS case reports. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So our next presentation is by Dr. Neil Cooper um, and uh, from Geisinger Medical Center, who will present the topic of transcable endoleak embolization by laser fenestration of IVC following an EVAR. Dr. Cooper? Thank you. 
As stated, my name's uh, Neil Cooper from Geisinger Medical Center. I'll be presenting on the transcable embolization of uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm sacs after EVAR using a laser fenestration technique. Come on, there we go. I have no uh, financial disclosures. We're all familiar with type 2 endoleaks after EVAR and uh, their typical management with transarterial, translumbar, or even transcable approaches. Previously described uh, transcaval approaches have utilized a curved endovascular transjugular intrahepatic access needle in order to gain access from the IVC into the aneurysm sac. Uh, we did attempt this several times, but we were dissatisfied with the rigidity and lack of maneuverability that this platform provided. So we uh, have begun approaching these through a transfemoral venous approach with a steerable sheath that provides a stable platform to allow us to laser fenestrate through the retroperitoneum directly into the aortic sac. In this particular uh, case is an 83 year old active male who had an EVAR with left renal artery stent for a 5.8 centimeter AAA in May of 2019. Initially, uh, he had sac regression without an endo leak. However, uh, his uh, extended follow-up imaging at 19 months demonstrated sac enlargement to 6.1 centimeters and a type 2 endo leak with concern from arising from a lumbar artery. And here you can see apposition of the IBC against our uh, aneurysm sac. Also, we uh, did not see any type 1 or type 3 endo leak. We uh, took this gentleman to the operating room. We started with an arteriogram to confirm that we did not have a type 1 or 3 endo leak. We then gained right common femoral access and introduced a 16 French aptus tour guide steerable sheath. We used some hybrid imaging to be able to guide us for our sheath placement and confirmed that our uh, sheath was adequately approximated against the aneurysm sac utilizing cone beam CT. This allows us to then use the 2.3 millimeter Turbo Elite laser catheter in order to gain access to the aneurysm sac. We then uh, guided a 5 French sheath up through our 16 French uh, steerable sheath in order to get a secure pr uh, purchase within the aneurysm sac. This allowed us to perform a sacogram, evaluate for any visible endo leak, and to be able to uh, effectively embolize the entirety of the aneurysm sac utilizing a very stable platform. Uh, we were able to embolize that with multiple coils and thrum and seal it. At the completion, we were able to perform an arteriogram as well as a venogram in order to demonstrate that there was no extravasation and that there was no uh, aortic cable fistula. Follow-up for these patients can be a little complicated due to the amount of uh, embolic material that we place within those sacs. However, utilizing metal artifact reduction techniques with CT scanning, we're able to get a relatively good CT image in order to do volumetric measurements in, order, in, in addition to standard uh, duplex follow-up. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, great presentation. Uh, question for you, uh, how did you, did you, how did you, uh, uh, what do you do with the hole in the cava with the five cut sheet? Do you, do you hold pressure there? Do you put a plug there? How do you fix that? Uh, so at the completion of embolizing the aortic aneurysm sac, we usually ins instill a fibrin sealant into the aneurysm sac as well. Uh, given that the, there's low pressure within the aneurysm sac, we're dealing with retroperitoneum and a relatively low pressure uh, vena cava. We've done this on about a dozen patients uh, and we haven't had any leak demonstrated afterwards. Sounds good. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Matthew Doherty, and is, is there any risk for the laser causing damage to endogram or causing type 3 endoleak? Absolutely. Uh, so prior to choosing a patient for this approach, we carefully study their CT scan. We do use uh, cone beam imaging on the, on the table in order to try and avoid that uh, potential complication. Uh, assuming that we were to have that complication, uh, we would obviously have to address it. Depending on where we were uh, entering into the aneurysm sac and where the EVAR was, methods such as relining the aneurysm, uh, relining the endograft would be uh, probably our primary approach in order to address that. Sounds good. Thank you so much once again. Very well. Right. For the interest of time, we'll, we'll keep moving along. Our next presenter is Dr. Christopher Capellani from Pennsylvania Hospital, who will be presenting uh, on the topic of superior vena cava syndrome requiring median sternotomy and core matrix pay, uh, patch angioplasty. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? 
Yes, if you can just go into full screen. Great. Sure. Hi, my name is Chris Capolini. I'm a fourth year resident at PCOM in Philadelphia. I'm going to present an operative case of superior vena cava syndrome on behalf of the attendings at Pennsylvania Hospital. So this is a 39 year old Hispanic male with end stage renal disease on hemodialysis who presented with severe facial and neck swelling, as well as pulsatility in his left upper extremity AV fistula. He's got a past medical history of end stage renal disease and hypertension. Past surgically, he's had multiple perm casts as well as bilateral upper extremity AV fistulas. Physical exam was notable for an edematous neck and face, as well as a left upper extremity AV fistula with pulsatility. Otherwise, he had an unremarkable physical exam. So we performed a left arm fistulography via the functional AV fistula. Uh, we suspected that the fistula was compromised. As you can see here, the left subclavian and left anominate veins were patent. Further imaging shows that there was no visualization of the superior vena cava and that the venous system only filled by the azagous collaterals. We then attempted to access the SVC transfemorally, however, we were unable to recanalize the SVC, as you can see here. <clears throat> we attempted to cross the lesion via the right axillary vein, however, we were unable to cross the right uh, nominate vein due to an occlusion. And you can see this here, there was a right nominate vein occlusion. In overview, there was a collusion of the proximal right nominate vein and SVC. Uh, we plan to perform an open SVC reconstruction by median sternotomy. Uh, we suggested an open reconstruction to the patient um, to salvage his AV fistula and provide a long-term durable access, as well as address the SVC syndrome. Felt that he was a good candidate for open reconstruction because of the younger age and few comorbidities. So regarding the operative technique, we performed a median sternotomy and exposed the SVC and the bifurcation of the left and right denominants. Our initial plan was to reconstruct the SVC with a core matrix tube graft to the left and right nominance. However, we encountered significant fibrosis at the right nominance, as well as a short segment of focal fibrotic region at the confluence of the left and nominate SVC. We then performed a focal endovenectomy of the left and nominate and SVC, and ultimately performed a core matrix patch angioplasty of the left and nominate SVC. Here's some intraoperative pictures. Here's the SVC in the occluded right and nominate. Here is the core matrix patch being placed. And here's the end result. Here's the SVC and the patch repair of the left and nominate in SVC. CT scan was performed during the same admission, which shows patency of the venous system. Here on the right, you can see the left and nominate. And moving down, here's the patch repair, as well as the SVC, and everything was patent. The patient did well postoperatively. He had improvement of his edema. He has a functional AV fistula. He was discharged home and is doing well at six month follow up. Are there any questions? Very nice case. Um, no, I don't have any, any, I don't have any questions. So pretty, pretty classical uh, big surgery uh, for a problem uh, which is encountered very often in patients with dialysis. Anybody has any other questions? All right, good, good job. <laughs> we'll keep moving along. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Joseph Fullerpack, and he'll be presenting on, um, from Cusa Chester Medical Center, and he'll be presenting on the topic of one surgical approach to a mitotic aortic aneurysm. Good evening. Uh, can anybody see my screen? Yes, if you can go to full screen mode. Okay. So my name is Joseph Hlobeck. I'm a second year at Crozier Chester Medical Center, and I'll be uh, presenting a case of a mycotic aortic aneurysm uh, with Dr. Khan, uh, Dr. Fink, Dr. Chizia, and Dr. Saja. So our patient at hand is a 55-year-old black male. Uh, he has a, a came in with low back pain, uh, left flank, and left leg pain. Uh, this has been going on for several weeks uh, and, and reported uh, about 20 pound weight loss during the same period of time. Uh, two days prior to his admission, he did uh, develop acute worsening of the pain and also an inability to ambulate, which is what brought him in. Uh, this patient is a schizophrenic and he lived with his brother who was his POA and uh, there's uh, meds, there's risperidone and cogentin and only past surgical history was a back lipoma excision. Uh, of note, he is a 30 pack year smoker. Uh, on exam, he did have a slight temperature of 100.4 and uh, uh, slightly hypertensive at 136 over 75 and uh, leukocytosis on admission. Did appear disheveled and malnourished and did have some poor dentition, which is of note as well. 
Uh, on vascular exam, he had a palpable uh, femoral pulse on the left uh, with some Doppler signals uh, uh, distally, but on the right, uh, no palpable femoral uh, pulse, um, but uh, did have very minimal signals distally. Uh, he did have some left flank and back pain with uh, leg larries, but otherwise he was uh, motor and sensory intact. I have a video here, uh, CTA, uh, showing uh, his aorta down. We're going to follow it, find the SFA, I'll slow it down here. SMA, or celiac is open. SMA is open in the renals as well. And then just distal to the renals, you see that there's a complete occlusion of the aorta. As you go further down, notice a few, so a few calcifications, and then we see a uh, aneurysmal sac come into view. There does appear to be a little bit of uh, inflammation surrounding the sac, uh, and the maximal dimension was about 3.8 centimeters by 4.9 centimeters. Uh, we continue to follow that down. It's bilateral occluded uh, iliacs um, uh, with refill uh, or a retrograde fill of his IMA. Continue that down, and we see that he has uh, a little bit of thrombus extending on the right side into the external iliac, but otherwise patent femoral and SFA and profundus. Uh, here are some, I'll let that scroll through uh, as I show these images over to the right of the screen, uh, just showing maximal dimension of the aorta, uh, aortic sac and complete occlusion. And uh, far over here on the right, you see that they're measuring approximately uh, two centimeters from the renals uh, where the thrombus starts. Uh, so. Our surgery, uh, we just elected to take this patient to the operating room for uh, uh, um, a midline laparotomy with aortic uh, re uh, resection. We did bilateral cut downs first then to the femorals, uh, got control of the uh, common femoral artery as well as uh, the collateral from his uh, epigastrics and uh, covered those up with Ioban while we focused our attention on doing the midline laparotomy. Um, as we made our way down to the aorta, uh, we um, uh, gain control of the um, uh, distal, distally uh, with the uh, common iliacs. But as we entered into the sac, uh, we did note that there was some gross purulence encountered, and this was sent for uh, culture. Um, the aortic was uh, completely debrided uh, and noted to have some chronic thrombus uh, inside, uh, which was distal to the renals and which extended down into the common iliacs as we saw on the CT scan. Uh, we did perform a uh, uh, aorta bifemoral uh, bypass with Dacron graft that was soaked in rifampin and a mental wrap um, to cover the, the graft up. Abdomen was closed. Uh, Postoperatively, uh, the patient did have a complicated, complicated course with uh, prolonged ileus. I required TPN and uh, NG tube decompression uh, the intraoperative cultures uh, grew salmonella, and uh, we had our ID colleagues following who recommended uh, eight weeks of uh, IV cephalaxone, followed by a lifelong prophylaxis with augmentin. The uh, patient was eventually uh, able to ambulate and uh, uh, tolerate a regular diet and uh, discharged home on post op day uh, 15. This time I'll, I can take some questions. Thank you. Nice case presentation. So I have two questions. Number one, uh, it looks like the aneurysm was chronically thrombosed. Um, what do you think caused infection of a chronically thrombosed uh, aneurysm? And number two, um, instead of using a prosthetic uh, graft here, do you consider using a uh, cryoaorta? Uh, so to answer your first question, uh, this patient was a very disheveled man. Uh, he did have some poor dentition and we had concern that uh, there might be a periodontal infection that had ultimately led to the uh, bacterial seeding of the aneurysm. The patient did not have bacteremia at uh, the time of his admission, although he did have a leukocytosis. Um, so we had him evaluated, um, uh, but there was no signs of active infection within his oral cavity. Uh, so um, that was the running theory at the time, but we didn't actually have uh, a, a confirmed source. Uh, and in terms of answering the second question, uh, we the, the use of the cryo-preserved uh, uh, homograft was uh, discussed 
However, we uh, uh, elected to go with the Dacron graft just because of its availability uh, uh, for this patient, given his uh, poor uh, vascular exam uh, when he presented. All right. Thank you. Dr. Calagero has a question. And the question is, did you consider doing X biofilm first, then excise the infected uh, aneurysm? Um, he, uh, he says, I agree, something would likely need to be done because collateral would have been knocked off if you just excised the graft and did nothing else. Uh, so there, like, again, there, that uh, was an option that was uh, explored, but given the patient was hemodynamically stable, he was not fluidly uh, septic on his presentation. So we felt that uh, although he did have a, a smoking history, um, that he was an adequate uh, candidate to go uh, forward with uh, the open approach. Um, and he is uh, about over a year out from his surgery at this point and has been seen in the clinic and is doing well. Uh, the only medications he's taking are for hypertension and uh, he just was started on medicine for hypercholesterolemia. Sounds good, thank you so much. All right, we'll keep moving. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Christopher uh, Blackstock, uh, who will present on the topic of surgical management of a metastatic paraganglioma with local invasion into internal colloid artery. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to, this, to the society for the invitation to present tonight. So our patient is a 49 year old man who presented with a slowly enlarging neck mass, which he first noted three years ago. On physical exam, the mass was pulsatile, non-tender and triggered a gag reflex when palpated. He underwent series of imaging, including a CTA, which is shown here on the right, which suggested the mass to be a carotid body tumor with circumferential encasement of the internal carotid artery shown in the figure below, consistent with a class three Chamberlain classification. The patient had no predisposing risk factors for a carotid body tumor, no history of living at high altitude, no family history, genetic testing for the succinate dehydrogenate dehydrogenase mutation was negative. Whole body PET scan confirmed the diagnosis of a paraganglioma and also showed involvement of adjacent lymph nodes concerning for a malignant process. However, there was no evidence of distant metastasis. Additionally, biochemical analysis revealed serum catecholamines and metanephrines were elevated. Therefore, an alpha receptor blocker was started preoperatively. Also prior to resection, the patient went to neuro IR for an angiogram, which is shown here. And as you can see, there's a highly vascularized mass, which is splaying the internal and external carotid arteries, further supporting the diagnosis of a carotid body tumor. The mass was embolized to help reduce intraoperative blood loss, as well as a balloon occlusion test of the internal carotid artery was done, which was negative suggesting that the patient could tolerate carotid clamping without the need for shunting. So we took the patient to the OR, the assistance of our ENT colleagues who performed a selective lymph node dissection. As we were mobilizing the tumor, we found that the mass was densely adherent to the surrounding tissue and we were unable to separate the tumor from the internal carotid artery. We therefore made the decision to perform to remove the tumor in block along with a carotid bifurcation in the proximal portion of the internal car carotid artery in order to achieve a definitive re resection. We then reconstructed the carotid artery with an interposition bypass using the patient's autologous reverse gray saphenous vein, as shown here. And you can see in this video, the proximal anastomosis to the common carotid artery here and the distal anastomosis to the internal carotid artery here. In our next video, we're just verifying dopperable flow to the, in the internal carotid artery, distal to our bypass. <laughs> you, can, you can hear that there's good diastolic flow as well as blunting, complete blocking of flow when clamping the, our bypass. So postoperatively, the patient did, did well. He remained neurologically intact. At one month follow-up, carotid duplex showed our bypass was widely patent. 
and pathology confirmed the diagnosis of a metastatic paraganglioma with invasion into the wall of the carotid artery. And from an oncologic standpoint, our resection margins were negative, and the plans for radiation therapy, as well as annual surveillance imaging. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Um, sounds good. Great presentation. I have uh, two questions. Dr. Caligero is asking, what would you have done if the 12th cranial nerve had been running through the tumor? Um, that, that would have been problematic. We, we may have uh, tried our best to peel it off of the tumor um, and then potentially, you know, called in our plastic surgery colleagues to reconstruct the, the cranial nerve 12 or if, if we had to, uh, to perform a, to, to resect part of the nerve along with the tumor, we could potentially use, you know, I, I believe they, they can use a, a tube which the, the nerve can regenerate through in order to restore function. So if Dr. Caligaro is your examiner in the board of surgery exam, he actually answered for you. And the answer is uh, the sural nerve interposition and ENTs, ENT guys usually can do. Good, Good job, thank you. Uh, thank you Dr. Caligaro for the, for the tip. Uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Dimuzi has a question for you as well. Great case, fun to do. Uh, he says, our neurosurgeons uh, will percutaneously embolize Shalman twos and threes for us noticeable decrease in blood loss. I agree. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Great case. You. All right, moving on to our, uh, uh, our last presentation uh, is by Dr. Uh, Dr. Michael Kakrish uh, from Thomas Jefferson, who will be, uh, be discussing open revascularization for renal failure one month after an EVAR. Hi, how are you doing? Good morning, or good evening, sorry. Um, let me just share my screen. Are you, hold on a second. That's it, yep. All That's right. good. Great. All right, guys, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be able to come in and present in front of you guys. Um, so uh, today I have a case uh, from Thomas Jefferson. This is a 74-year-old uh, male who had uh, presented with um, a 4.7 centimeter inferior area of aneurysm that was saccular in nature. Um, his past medical history was diabetes, hypertension, obesity, atrial fibrillation on eloquence, and uh, a chronic kidney disease that was uh, stage three. Um, at the time, he had some mild tenderness to his uh, abdomen, otherwise was um, well-appearing. Um, and uh, given the second of nature, we felt as though he can under undergo an elective procedure. Um, so just a little video of the CT scan so you can see the saccular aneurysm. Let me slow it down for you. You can see renals, our neck. You can see the saccular nature there. And then relatively normal anatomy of the iliacs. So we performed an EVAR. Uh, we uh, used a uh, Cook graph. Uh, we uh, had uh, really no issues in deployment. Um, and uh, you can see here our uh, final uh, arteriogram um, showing the renals uh, bilaterally patent as well as uh, preservation of the hypogastrics. Um, so about one month afterwards, uh, he had a couple weeks before follow-up. Um, he had no reported issues, no pain, no problems, um, and it really wasn't until we uh, uh, drew a BMP on him for his uh, CTA follow-up um, that we saw he had uh, essentially doubled his creatinine and decreased his GFR by about half. Um, this is kind of alarming to us, obviously, um, and uh, we uh, wanted to see if anything happened to the kidneys, um, so we did an arterial duplex, and unfortunately, this showed uh, no arterial flow in the right renal artery. It was kind of confusing to us uh, given our uh, final arteriogram. So we uh, went back to the aortogram and um, looking at it, I pointed out the fabric line for you. You know, it's 
looks like we did encroach up onto the right renal, um, but uh, we did have uh, perfusions through both of them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of alarming to see now that he has no flow. Um, so given this finding, uh, we uh, discussed with the patient um, about seeing the salvageability here. So we uh, ordered a nuco scan for him and saw there was still residual 15% uh, function of that kidney. Um, and uh, given he was already at stage three uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, we felt like it was uh, important to be able to revascularize him. Um, and uh, we wanted to go back to the LWAR to attempt this endovascularly. So we attempted uh, via left brachial access. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, oh, I'm sorry. Weren't able to not only cannulate, but couldn't even visualize the right renal artery. Um, and uh, after multiple attempts, uh, we uh, aborted this um, and uh, uh, wanted to have a discussion with the patient um, a little further. So the discussion with him was in regards to attempting an open procedure um, to revascularize the kidney. Um, he's an obese man. He does have some comorbidities, uh, but uh, an extra anatomic bypass seemed reasonable um, that uh, he would be able to tolerate. So. Um, yeah, he agreed uh, in going with the open procedure, and we felt uh, he would uh, approach this extra anatomic with a uh, hepatorenal bypass. Now, going back to his CT scan, just to kind of show you guys again, he did have uh, some aberrant anatomy, and here's a celiac. And then coming off the SMA was a replaced right, re uh, right hepatic artery. As you can see here, I'm going to go back. And then there's our right renal on the right side. Again, this is all pre-EVAR. Um, um, on here, just a uh, coronal view. And again, you can see the right renal artery. I'm gonna go back for you. And then right there, you'll see the right hepatic come off as well. Um, it's a robust artery, and we felt like this could be our inflow, uh, given the size of it. Um, however, we always had our backup, which would be the common hepatic in this situation. So um, we uh, went to the operating room um, and uh, we did a uh, right uh, subcostal incision. Uh, we did an extended cocorization of the uh, duodenum and the uh, hepatic flexure. Um, we were able to expose the kidney and the renal vein, dissected the renal vein out circumferentially, um, and then uh, uh, dissected out the uh, renal artery as well, circumferentially up to the origin of the aorta. Um, just some pictures here to kind of show you um, C, uh, letter C, uh, this picture down here, um, shows you how we approach the uh, origin of the uh, right renal artery um, on the aorta uh, behind the IVC. Um, once we had uh, the right renal artery out, um, we uh, brought our attention to the superior aspect essentially of the uh, uh, field, which we saw a vessel. Um, it happened to be actually the right hepatic artery. Um, so without losing any exposure um, and having to move anything around, we were actually able to dissect out the uh, right hepatic artery um, quite easily. Um, and uh, it, again, was a robust artery, had great flow through it. Um, and uh, we want to use this as our uh, inflow. Um, given the close proximity of uh, the arteries, uh, we actually had felt uh, immediate transposition here would be best. Um, so we uh, went ahead and did that. We uh, transected the uh, right renal artery at the aorta, uh, brought it up over top of the IVC, um, and then uh, we announced the most uh, directly to the uh, aberrant right hepatic artery, um, doing a uh, antisite anastomosis. Um, afterwards, it was good Doppler flow, um, and uh, we felt as though uh, we were quite satisfied with this case. Um, so we closed him and uh, sent him to uh, the uh, ICU for recovery. Postoperatively, he actually did quite well, um, and we saw a, uh, a decrease in his uh, creatinine and the GFR came back up to baseline about 43 uh, during his stay. Um, he was able to actually get discharged on post-op day six, and two weeks later had a duplex uh, follow-up uh, showing the arterial um, flow through that renal artery. So um, just to kind of finish up here, uh, you know, I thought this is an important case for us um, to discuss because of a couple things. Um, one was the uh, false sense of security that you can get at an aortogram due to the heparinization. 
um, you know, we did encroach on the right renal um, and we saw opacification of the uh, right renal artery. Um, I don't think, you know, we would have intervened on it knowing we encroached since we did have opacification, but, you know, the masking of anticoagulation, um, you know, can be uh, quite dangerous, I guess. Um, I think another thing to discuss is uh, just for my colleagues who are in training, um, <clears throat> you know, open surgery and extra anatomic bypasses like this may not necessarily come along all the time. And I think it's important to at least share this with you guys in regards to our step-by-step -step process of going from endovascular and our advanced techniques to um, a, a bypass and how to approach things in an open fashion. That's all I have. All right. Thank you for um, thank you for sharing the case. You know, it's a little unusual one month after this. So, a um, couple of questions. I, I'll I'll ask uh, before I ask my question. That Dr. Keith Carragher wrote two questions. Number one, he said uh, even if the right renal artery was occluded post EVAR, uh, but with a bidirectal and left renal artery, uh, he should have maintained normal prepping. I mean, you need one kidney for 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 normally you can survive in one kidney. Was the left kidney poorly functioning? Uh, did you get and how did you did you get a renal scan? Uh, please explain. Yeah, so uh, it's actually something we discussed too. Uh, we thought that was actually quite interesting that he had a rise in his creatinine as well, um, and uh, agreed a month out and he had no symptoms. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting, but uh, the nuclear scan showed the left kidney was working. It was it was doing eighty five percent of the work, um, but. Um, you know, I, I don't know if we really did anything further than that in our workup as, as I can remember. Um, but, uh, you know, given that, that drop in the GFR and his uh, already advanced uh, chronic kidney disease, it's, it's uh, felt necessary. I guess my other question is that, uh, you know, if the left renal artery, if the right renal artery is occluded, uh, when we do open triple A repairs, you know, we go by the time of 40 minutes, you know, keep it less than 40 minutes. Because after that, the end organ damage has has already you know has already occurred. Uh, one month is a long period of time. Uh, yeah. uh, how do you know if the kidney was still functioning and doing? You know, it's a heroic operation that you guys did, but how would it how would it help the kidney and how would how would the kidney pick up? You know, it's um again a discussion. We had a discussion with his nephrologist, and uh, you know the nuclear scan showed there was still residual function. Um, and for a month out to still have residual function, we felt like there still may be some salvageability here, um, you know, because if he, this guy unfortunately gets a, a second hit on that other kidney, he may be end up on dialysis. So um, it was just, I think that discussion, um, you know, seemed like it was worth a shot given his comorbidities weren't too bad to uh, attempt this in an open fashion after we uh, weren't able to do endovascular, but. Right. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much. I, Dr. Dimuzi wrote the message that you guys are tag teaming in the OR and presenting at the same time. So good job. <laughs> thank you, guys. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, so I guess that concludes the, the uh, that includes the, 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 uh, the discussion for today. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for all the presenters for, for uh, taking your time and presenting it today. Uh, it is now time to vote for a top paper. If you're ready to vote, um, um, go ahead and uh, give your choices. Yes, if you've already voted in the test poll at the beginning of the night, you do not need to uh, retext the word event polls. You should be able to vote two times now. I do see the results coming in. Yeah, let me try again. We still have some results coming in. Yeah, mine is still not working out. Um, uh, someone did just type a number into the chat, and you do need to join the poll by texting the word event polls, E V E N T E V E N T P O L L S, to the number 22333. Do that once, and then you have 
two options, two times to vote. You can vote for your top two papers. The votes are still coming in now. Dr. Aziz, have you been able to uh, join? Uh, no, it keeps giving me an error message, by the way. I skipped giving a message. Your presenter, Bart Evans, has not opened a poll yet. <laughs> I believe you probably sent the wrong code. So if you type the word leave, uh -huh. you, you will leave whatever polling session you may have joined. Type the word leave. Uh -huh. and submit then? that, and then type the word event polls, all one word. And it should say that you have joined Rillahan events poll. Now it says that. Okay, okay, now you can vote. Send in your first paper number and then your second paper number. Got it. Thank you. And we are, uh, we do have a winner right now, but um, let's see where you're, how you come in. I'm going to text you the uh, winner name. All right, is it final? Uh, yes, we do have uh, a definitive, Sounds definitive winner. All righty, so uh, we're happy to announce that Dr. Kelly Dowdy is the winner uh, for, for tonight's presentations. Good job, Dr. Dowdy. Thank you very much. All right, Dr. Trang, I think it's um, um, uh, and uh, Jose. Yep, I'm here. No, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so once again, uh, thank you everyone for coming and participating in uh, another successful DVVS uh, meeting. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting and uh, chatting with everyone live in the fall. Um, I think that's going to be a really exciting meeting. Uh, just as a quick sneak peek, we will be focusing on carotid disease at that juncture. Um, and we have a really good uh, nationally known speaker who's coming in. So um, everyone look for that uh, and please register to attend. Uh, and so at this juncture, um, I would ask that all non-DVVS members uh, go ahead and please exit so that the DVVS membership can continue with the uh, DVVS business meeting. And for the DVVS members who are staying, I promise to make this uh, pretty quick and efficient. Okay, um, so with regards to the business meeting, um, We've got just a couple of uh, items that we're going to need votes on uh, by the membership. Uh, first is uh, a bylaws change. Uh, and um, we had to make a bylaws change this past year uh, as a result of COVID. Um, we can make the change by a three quarter uh, of the people who are voting uh, saying that yes, they approve the change to the bylaw. Um, and the Bylaw really centered around the uh, DVVS Executive Committee um, and the fact that we uh, did not have an annual meeting last year uh, and did not have an annual meeting this year. And uh, typically what happens is that the um, Executive Committee turns over uh, at the end of the annual meeting to the newly uh, proposed and elected uh, Executive Committee. So the proposed change uh, basically uh, is that we were gonna have an annual members business meeting. Um, and the other thing was that the, the prior one stated that the uh, business meeting had to be in person. And so we've um, changed that to say that the business meeting should take place in the spring. Uh, it can be in person or remote. Um, and the executive committee um, can either um, turn over or uh, ex if extenuating circumstances uh, uh, warrant uh, could potentially uh, stay on. Um, if you are would, ready, uh, we can bring the vote up now or whenever you are ready. Absolutely. 
Um, everyone should see a pop up now and uh, should be able to choose. Great, thank you everyone for uh, voting yes to proposition, uh, kidding, to the uh, proposed change to the bylaw. All right, um, moving on, um, we had uh, two applications that we need to um, approve membership for uh, both John Radka and Sai uh, Saja. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, um, this is the proposal for the new slate of executive committee members, um, highlighted by Evan Ryer uh, as next year's president. Um, new uh, members uh, to the committee include uh, Megan Germandy and Gregory uh, Salzler, and the uh, <laughs> Thankless job of being the program committee chair will be Danielle Pineda. Wonderful. And that should pretty much do it for the members meeting. Um, it's been an interesting year as your president, um, presiding over two virtual meetings. Um, again, I expect that we will be back to live meetings uh, and I hope everybody had an enjoyable evening. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you very much.